Hey, I hope you enjoy this episode. I told you in the first video, I was coming right back with the second one on the resume, and I taped it right afterwards. So I hope everything moves smoothly. I didn't get a chance to look at the first one yet. But as I said, I'm learning, and I'll get better at this each time. Just give me a chance. You're going to learn a lot. But I think it's important, as you watch social media and you find people you want to learn from, you really find out who they are. You know, their resume. And the resume is never what they did. It's what they're doing. And I'll say that again. The resume is never what they did. I can say, and I'll say it because I am proud of it, don't get me wrong, that I have X amount of players in the NFL, a couple players in Major League Baseball, some great women's softball players, uh, Heisman Trophy winner. I'm proud of those accomplishments. I played a small part genetics, uh, their parenting. They played the largest part. I played a very small role in their success. Very proud of that. But if you look at those accomplishments and you keep saying, I did, I did, I did, I was, well, you're not going to be anything. So I think your resume is really, what are you doing right now? And I said in the first video, you've got to evaluate yourself. You have to evaluate yourself because you have to be honest. And if I want you to get better, because I need to get better every day, I have to evaluate myself. And to show you what this looks like, to be transparent, you have to be transparent. You know, I, when I evaluate where I've come from, from high school to today, I really look at myself as a person who was once soft, was lazy, became very driven, became lost, became very driven again, then got a couple years of complacency when I'm talking about their own physical uh, goals, accomplishments. And then right now, I can say I am driven, and very happy and I want to go through that because that's my resume that is my resume that's my path and you need to evaluate your path to really become a better person and I think you need to do this even in your own training your own fitness routine and let's let's stay with the word training I know it's fitness TV ND normalized discomfort fitness TV and the reason why I did fitness is because that's going to get a better search result than training but let's stay with training because you're training for life. So if we evaluate where I was at, I'm normal. So when we talk about the things I do now, you're like, man, that's crazy. I can't do that. You need to know where I came from. My freshman year in high school, and this is just one story, I remember we had conditioning one day. Conditioning was after a long practice, your high school fields, especially at the freshman level, hardly any grass on them, dirt, terrible. So I think we had to run 100 yards. Bear crawl so many, maybe get up, run a hundred, log roll, bear crawl, something to that extent. And I hated it. And I remember doing the bear crawl thinking I have 50 more yards. So I thought I would just fake dying. Just the worst breathing you've ever heard. It was actually hilarious now looking back. And nobody came to my rescue. And I thank God that they didn't. Um, because if they would have, I would have just done it every day. But I was soft then. I was always looking for a way to get out of hard conditioning, never pushing myself. And then I became lazy. Probably my sophomore, junior year, loved to play video games. If I played basketball, I didn't play hard. If I played baseball, I didn't play hard. If I played football, I didn't play hard. And I went from soft, a little tougher, because I put my body through it, but I wasn't very tough at all. But I was very lazy. And then two things happened. The first thing was my father got a hold of me. My father was a self-employed self -employed bricklayer, concrete mason, uh, put me to work for him. So I was carrying four to 500 block around, throwing them up on scaffold every day in the summertime, and then taking 20 to 30 wheelbarrows down a plank that was, th each wheelbarrow probably weighed 300 pounds. And I really found out what hard work was. So that was from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. And then I'd lift in the evening, and I really got an appetite for how hard it is to make a dollar in society. That was the first thing. The second thing was, I always loved watching boxing. So I decided to go to a boxing gym. I went to East Coast Gym on 30th Street in Canton, Ohio, where I'm from. And I trained. I was under 18, so I didn't have permission to get in the ring. But I trained for a long time. I went to college. And I immediately joined a boxing gym. And at that time I was 18, so I got in the ring. And I got my ass kicked. In 
And when you get your ass kicked by a really good boxer, somebody I think he had 19 fights, he might have been 19 and 0 as an amateur, there's nothing you can do. When somebody has 19 fights and you've never been in the ring, you get tense, you get tight, you get your ass kicked. Well, I didn't come back. It was two weeks later, and I made a decision, thinking about my father and his hard work, what would he do? And I went back to that gym. And that was one of the biggest steps I've ever taken in my life. And when that happened, a little bit of a drive started in me for mental toughness through training. And I started boxing, and I started competing. And I really found out that boxing was my sport. Not basketball, not football, not lifting, not power lifting. I've done all those. Uh, baseball. But boxing was my sport, and I loved it. And that drive happened in me for boxing. I wanted the condition. I wanted to get in the gym. I wanted to lift for endurance. I wanted to learn everything I could about boxing. I loved it. My box I was about 25 or 26 and then I was lost. Because what I looked for then was I watched my weight for a while. I was like 179, 175 is what I tried to fight at, 175 light heavyweight. But what I really happened was after I got done, I ate whatever I could and I lifted heavy and I wanted to see how strong I could get. And I wanted to fix all the self-esteem issues I had inside. I thought I could fix them through getting bigger and stronger. And I was wrong. But you don't know that at 25. So I thought if I could bench 315 X amount of times, which I think I did it 14 times, I'd be happy. It didn't make me any happier. I thought if I could squat 495 X amount of times, it would make me happier. Doing those things never made me happier. It might have made me worse made me feel worse about myself because as I got bigger and stronger at 252 I was miserable and that's why I call that stage lost I really do I call that lost low self-esteem no matter how good I looked outside and I'm not talking about physically facial I'm talking about musculature and then I went to the Ohio State Miami National Championship game and at that game I decided right there I want to be on that field to be a college football strength coach. And that was going to be my new commitment in life. And whatever it took from that moment on, I was going to do it. But the problem was, I didn't have a great college football career like a lot of other people. So how was I going to do it? Because that was my new drive. So this is where a lot of my resume comes in. A lot of people could see me on YouTube, do silly things, but they don't really know any of it. So if you go back here, you know, there's some sparring. I still love the spar. That's why I was 39 years old, and that's sparring. I think Abdul and I went about 20 rounds that day, and I love the spar. Still do. You can get with a really smart guy, get great conditioning, go at 40%, and really get a great workout, and I still love it to this day. As we look at these next couple pictures, a lot of people, you can pull me up on YouTube, you know, from the things I did at Marshall University with paddling and starting to beat my body, and and you know I started land-based shark fishing and noodling and stuff like that and this one's from the Western Kentucky ESPN game you know I had a punctured kidney and I'll talk about that but I go to Marshall University as a graduate assistant and there they have a talent show and I'm thinking to myself I got to do something to explain what's going to separate me because I don't have that college football background so I got to be mentally tough and the talent show was really supposed to be something fun was never supposed to be something outrageous so I did this talent show and my talent was I went last all new coaches all freshman football players did a talent and there were a lot of skits and making fun of people it wasn't a true talent show like oh you can play the violin it wasn't anything like that so I got up in front of the team 120 players or so probably 105 then uh, 105 players 120 130 people in the room I took a glass I dropped my pants I pissed right in the glass, had a guy named Doug Ligurski, and a lot of this I'll tell you names so you know it's true. Doug Ligurski played, started a Super Bowl for the Steelers at center. I said, who wants to smell this to know that's real? He smelled it and said, that is 100% real. Without hesitation, I drank it, threw the glass in the trash can, and walked out. And I just wanted to set the, hey, this is my talent. I can take my mind to a place a lot of people can't. And that kind of started something right there in my career 
that players always thought, man, he's going to do something crazy. So from there, I had strength coaches call me or GAs call me or high school coaches call me my whole career and say, I want to be a strength coach more than anything in this world. I'll come and work for you right now. Well, let me tell you what I want, how bad I wanted to be a strength coach. My father passed away. I had $2,000 and no bills. And I told myself, if I have to go in debt, then I'm going to go back and get a job, a normal job. I was a math teacher, and I worked at a hospital right before I became a GA. But when I was a GA, I told myself, after I get my master's, if I am in major debt, I'm done. I chased my dream. I'm going to go get a job. So I told myself I can't just spend money, spend money, because I worked as a personal trainer at night, GA'd, did assistant football, or GA for football, had baseball as my own team, softball as my own team, and went to class full time. So at this point, I have what they call a Paul Nigel cyst, and I feel it coming through my tailbone, and I don't have any health insurance. My father just passed away. Uh, he carried our health insurance in the family. So I had to make a choice. I went and saw a team doctor. I thought he could just take care of it in the training room. He said he would have to admit me. I didn't need have to be put under. Uh, it's a small minor surgery. Sorry about that. The uh, camera cut off. But it was an awesome experience to say I did my own surgery. So when kids call me or people would call me and say, hey, I want to be a strength coach, I never brought that story up. I've never even told that story. Mike Nolan was somebody that also went through something similar uh, so he could justify that story. I played tight end at Marshall. was also a GA at the time. But that's what I think about. How bad do you want something? Are you willing to do something like that? And I had a player who won a Super Bowl a couple years ago with the Eagles named Vinnie Curry. Vinnie Curry came to me before we played at FIU in the 2011 St. Pete's Bowl. And he asked me, because I did this earlier in the year, to uh, take the gate key to Marshall University Football Stadium and swallow it. And the theme was, they're going to have to beat us physically so bad, we're going to swallow the key, and the only way they're going to get out of the stadium we're going to lock the gates, swallow the key, and the only way they're getting out of the stadium is to kill us and cut it out of us. So I took the stadium key in my mouth before the game, swallowed it in front of the whole team, did that twice, never lost. Players went nuts. Everybody knows about the paddle. Not everybody knows, but I mean, I got a couple hundred thousand views on it. ESPN, everybody called me. And what happened with the paddle was, that was also a team chaplain thing. He said, we're physically going to beat Ohio University and he had a prop so I took that prop had a Scott Wilkes uh, hit me with it and then the players loved it it just blew up and got bigger and bigger and bigger uh, people thought it was fake if you see the bruise right here far from being fake I had ride though every time that happened from the bruising 100% real if you know Scott Wilkes nothing he did was fake uh, what happened with that is we stopped it because I felt like we were getting more attention than the game itself, and the game was about the players. So the last time we did that was at WKU. ESPN was there. We never told anybody we were going to do it. ESPN happened to be there. They filmed it. Uh, turned bad. Got some lung, uh, kidney damage from it. But it was a lot of fun. I don't regret any of it. Then I went to UofL, and UofL, same thing, first Power 5 job. So I started doing things that mentally, I don't think anybody ever even thought of. If a kid walked in the waiting room with a Band-Aid, like Jake Smith, who's now an attorney, he had a Band-Aid one day, bloody Band-Aid, just got cut. And I said, hey, there's no Band-Aids in this waiting room. I ripped it off, put it in my mouth, chewed it up, and swallowed it. And I didn't think second about doing that stuff. And I just went on. Somebody would complain about, oh, so-and-so's got staph infection. I'd walk over, oh, you got staph infection from last week? You're fine. Let me see the wound. Like, it, you know, I just did that stuff, and mentally, nothing could harm me. And I was building that staircase of adversity, and the biggest thing is, I was putting myself in a mental position. When I faced adversity outside of the weight room or in my life, it was nothing, because I was mentally that strong at that point. And I think I was only at 60% of my potential. So we went hand fishing, swimming down in hand, you know, holes, putting your hand in cat fishing, no problem, do that. Walked down the Ohio River, said, man, I've never swim longer than a swimming pool in my life. I wonder how hard it is to swim across the Ohio River, about a half mile. 
just jumped and swam. Nobody was around. The worst part of doing something like that is walking over the bridge soaking wet um, with cars buzzing by. So if you're ever going to do that, I would drive over, walk the bridge dry, and then swim to your car. That's the better way to do that. I learned that one. And then 2016, I was going to, or sorry, 2015, I was going to do an ultra marathon. I was actually scared. I had the longest I ever ran was 6.2 miles, 10K. Came back, trained, did the ultra marathon. And this, I'm going to take some time here. I know this is getting long, but this is important. I trained in Louisville, Kentucky for the ultra marathon. January, February, March, April. Very mild temperatures, a lot of 40s and 50s. I go down to the Florida Keys, the Keys 100. In 2015, it was 90 degrees with 90% humidity that day. And I never trained in anything close to that. So I read a lot of books. And at some time they said, in, in the books they said at some point you could have suicidal thoughts, your first ultra or many ultras that you do. And if you get over, it's not going to last long. It's going to last five minutes, ten minutes. But if you get over that, then you're, you're good. So I knew that was going to come. And that came to me in that ultra a lot sooner than I inspect, expected it. And I remember going over one of the many bridges going down the Florida Keys. And I looked over the side of the bridges. I was going at about a five mile an hour, five and a half mile an hour pace. Because this was early. This was like mile 27. And I thought about jumping off the side of the bridge. And I really did to end it. And if my ride would have drove by, who's now an NFL head strength coach, if he would have drove by, I would have jumped in the car and quit. But I got over that. And anytime I do something, I'd always look back at that and say, man, I got over that. I had suicidal thoughts and I got over that. And I stopped one time to go to the bathroom at one point and had 30 miles left. And I said, I can't stop anymore. I'm not going to finish this. And I fought through it and did that. Even if I had to walk, I walked. But I had enough to finish that. And that's what this run is right here. And then finally, the last picture up here of the stitches was we had a new weight room built at Louisville. And our old weight room got put into the indoor. So we were doing spring ball scrimmages. And our head coach said, make sure you protect the players where they don't run into any of the weight room gear. And this is where I knew mentally I started getting there. A player was running towards a rack. And most people would jump out of the way and try to grab the player. I didn't do that. Without thought, as he was coming to the ground, I tackled him. Went helmet to helmet with him, cut myself. And I look back at that and I think to myself, that was just an instinct. So I went from the softest kid in the world, in my opinion. I think I've reached 60 to 65 percent of my potential at that time. But my instinct was not to jump out of the way. So it's taking me to complacency. So I did the ultra marathon, I was a power five strength coach, and I had a large sum of money in the bank. Those were my goals. And what I did was I got a Range Rover, I got a new bass boat, I got a jet ski, I got a Tonka truck, and yes, I had a T-Rex, a Capagna T-Rex, the baddest thing ever made. Only about a hundred of them made a year, I owned one. That's actually mine right there, the red Capagna T-Rex, subs, loved it. Zero to 50 in two seconds. Ran around Louisville. There was two in the state of Kentucky, I believe. But what happened was, I got complacent. Yes, I showed up to work. I still worked hard. But physically, I quit pushing myself. So when I thought I was 60, 65% of my potential, I was slowly coming down. And I didn't need this. And guess what? When I drove this T-Rex around, yeah, it was fun to drive, but I didn't feel better about myself or a Range Rover, or this jet ski. So now I have the truck. And I ride my bike now, a bicycle, as much as I ride the, drive the truck. Um, so I'm down to one vehicle, because that's all I need. Uh, so that's something to be really aware of. What are your attention getting mechanisms, and why do you have them? So my current resume. Every week I do something very hard that brings me up a couple stairs on my staircase so i call that normalized discomfort training and i try to sit two to three hours apart on saturday or sunday and that's what i advise for you to do you can't do it every day because i know you have family jobs things like that but put two hours aside on saturday find the steepest hill you can and just run it for two hours and when you want to give in keep going 
Draw your goals. Never do one goal when it comes to working out. Your goal has to be from the inside out. So that means the first thing has to be a personal goal about getting better as a person and then a physical goal. Because if you get better from the inside out, you're going to be a happier person. Don't ever think you're going to put more muscle on and be better mentally. It's not going to work. Be better mentally, then the muscle will come. The conditioning will come. The self-esteem will come. Physical discomfort equals personal growth. Buy into that. And no matter what you do, in the words of David Goggins, know that you got to do it again tomorrow. So be really happy that you did something great on Saturday and Sunday. But know the next weekend, you got to raise that bar even higher to get better. So that's a key. And don't ever stop evaluating yourself. So where am I at? You know, I'll post a video of my uh, two-hour run of the Louisville Walking Bridge, which is two ramps, a mile over the Ohio River. Did that for two hours straight a couple weeks ago. Had a bachelor party. I finally got married. I was married to college football for many years. I found the love of my life. I uh, was able to marry her on March 8, 2019. And... That has brought a level of happiness that I've never had before. For my bachelor party, I had a friend uh, named Eric Wood, a great NFL player. He uh, said, hey, what do you want to do for your bachelor party? And one of the things I told him was, let's get a bunch of pizzas and go to the homeless and give them out. So that's a picture of us with uh, 50 Papa John pizzas. We're about ready to go to downtown Louisville and pass them out. And that's what I've evolved from, that little selfish Low self-esteem kid at 25 to a soft freshman to thinking about other people. And I've done it through mental conditioning. I promise you, mental conditioning. And then, of course, this is the walking bridge run. Two hours straight, 11.46 miles. Another run I did, and I'll probably post a video of that, was a Beckley Creek half-mile hill. Ran it 10 miles, half-mile down, half-mile up. Ran it 10 times, took me an hour and 40 minutes. So these are things I'm doing. Uh, this weekend, I won a uh, 3.5 for my age group, a 3.5 hill climb. Did it in 25 minutes and 2 seconds, which I'm proud of. And then got up, did 100 sets of dips in 100 minutes. Every minute I did a set of 8 dips for 100 minutes straight. Uh, and I want to increase that. So those are things that I'm doing right now. And that's really my resume. So now that you know a little bit about me, you know that I am an average person. I'm going to be transparent with you. And I'm going to share what I know. But don't do everything that I, that I do. Take a little bit and apply it to your life. And that's what this channel is going to be about. So hopefully you stick around and you enjoy it. I want to thank our sponsor, Fit Organics. Fit Organics is all about recovery for active individuals and athletes. It's CBD products, THC-free, the top CBD company because they care about what they put in their products. Very, very great, good testing. Check them out, fitorganics.com. Appreciate them, and hopefully the next time.